We're really delighted to have uh, with us this evening both uh, James Fallows and, and Deborah Fallows uh, to talk about their new book, Our Towns, uh, which is a fresh look at what's been happening in many smaller cities and towns uh, across the United States that uh, most of us and the media uh, don't usually get to. Uh, this isn't, uh, in case you were wondering, a quickie book in the wake of the 2016 election seeking to explain why America voted the way it did. Uh, Jim and Deb took their time with this one, beginning what turned into a 100,000-mile journey around the United States about the time Barack Obama was beginning his second term. And they finished last year, uh, of course, after Donald Trump had assumed power. And while there's been much commentary lately about how divided and angry our electorate is, uh, Jim and Deb came away from their travels with findings that point to, to other trends that they hadn't entirely anticipated at the outset. Their book is largely an encouraging portrait of a country animated at the local level by a spirit of uh, community revival uh, and renewal, uh, resilience and, and adaptability, uh, in contrast to the uh, political paralysis at the, at the national level. Uh, now, there's nothing like a little old-fashioned uh, shoe leather reporting to confirm or not conventional thinking. Although in this case, the shoes Jeb and Deb wore received a little help from a small plane they used to fly from place to place. Jim is an experienced instrument-rated pilot, and his and Deb's aircraft of choice was a Cirrus CR-22, which is a small single-engine propeller plane. The inside has bucket seats and bigger windows offering better views than many other single-engine aircraft, and one of its unique selling points is a parachute embedded in the top of the cockpit that can be released should the engine fail. But it's still a small plane, and the seat belts are more like harnesses that fit tightly uh, on passengers, with no area to get up and stretch one's legs, and certainly no space for a restroom. Uh, of course, there's a long tradition of writers, Alexis de Tocqueville and John Steinbeck, just to name two, uh, journeying across America, journeying across America to, um, to discover what's really going on. And Jim, uh, Jim and Deb uh, ended up making extended visits to 25 cities and did shorter trips to another two dozen. They brought to their journey a, li a lifetime of experience observing listening, and writing. Jim has been an accomplished, award-winning journalist uh, for more than four decades, uh, reporting mostly for The Atlantic, uh, with editing stints at the Washington Monthly and U.S. Uh, News and World Report. Um, and, and by the way, I'd like to thank the folks at The Atlantic uh, for their help in, in promoting uh, this evening's event. Uh, and back in the 1970s, Jim also served as President Carter's chief speechwriter and he's authored or, or co-authored 11 previous books on a range of national and international subjects. Deb is a linguist who holds, holds a PhD in theoretical linguistics. Uh, she's written for a number of publications and has worked at the Pew Research Center, Oxygen Media, and, and Georgetown University. She also has authored two uh, previous books, A Mother's Work and Dreaming in Chinese. So ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Jim, uh, Jim and Deb Fallows. Thank you so much, Brad. Deb, do you want to lead off or not? You, you're the pilot. <laughs> So thank, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so apart from Brad and Lane Wallace, who I see here, how many other pilots are in the room? I think uh, so it, that, that can, that's our, our common bond. Thank, thank you so much for coming out. We're really, really delighted to be here at the Wharf location, to have so many friends here and some relatives here. My sister Sue is here with her son and daughter-in-law and new baby grandson on his first, is this his first bookstore visit for baby Owen? So. So first of a long tradition for baby Owen. So thank you all. We have many friends from our neighborhood from different walks of our life. 
So Deb and I are honored to be here in our, our mainly hometown to tell you about other towns around the country. We'll talk for not too long, and we'll talk back and forth in the same way we, re- we have written the book, which is in alternating chapters by Deb and by me in different voices with different perspectives, which we hope amount to some semi-coherent uh, presentation by, by the end of the book and by the end of this, this evening. And so what we thought we'd do is I will tell you a little bit about the project itself, why we undertook it, what we were trying to accomplish. Deb is going to talk to you about one of the things she looked at particularly, which were schools. I will tell you something else more about some of the big surprises we found. Then Deb will tell you about one more thing she has discovered. And then we will have a big finish on what we are arguing about the rest of America and how it differs from what may be the prevailing wisdom. So that's the plan for the next you know, 25 or 30 minutes. Then we'll have time for questions. So uh, Patty, great to see you. Come on, have a seat. Uh, we are glad to see so many, so many friends here. So, <laughs> so, uh, so let me first say a word about how we decided to undertake this project. It was really about five years ago. We were, we were, oh, we we're having this in mind. So, over the last forty years or so since we first came to DC, more, more, more than forty years, right? It's been a while. It's been, uh, yeah. It, it's been a while. And and by the way, uh, this this month is the. 50th anniversary of Deb and me meeting on a blind date in college. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so it better go well. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so yeah, we're going. You know, so far so good. But we'll we'll, we'll see how how it works out in the long run. Uh, so we we've been in China for a number of years, and something that we uh, over the years we've been in, in D.C. About half has been in D.C. and half has been in other places, just back and forth in Japan, in Malaysia in Seattle and Berkeley and Texas and in China for a number of years. And in these other installments of our life away from DC, we had mainly uh, tried to be as much as we could out in the hinterland. We take buses, we take trains, we take in some cases ox carts to get into remote parts of, of China and then report was going on there. And after being back in DC for a while, we thought let's try to do the same thing in the US. We had known as a we had known two things as a backdrop. One was just the extreme strain on the American body politic from the crash of 2008, 2009. We were living in China when that, when that occurred, and of course the main theory was the U.S. finally has gone to hell. You know that it has dragged the whole world economy down with it, and and it's it's reaping the consequences. And we know that how how serious it was. The other background factor is over the years, we'd often flown in our little Cirrus SR-22 to to small places around the country, and we knew how easy it was to get to odd places that way. So we thought, let's go go traveling. So five years ago, right now, I put an item on the Atlantic site saying, tell us the story of your town. And uh, we were looking for towns of a certain kind, smaller towns, which meant they didn't have to be tiny but there were places that would be considered the sticks by the national news media. That, that the, you would not have, you would send reporters there mainly if there were a shooting or a political campaign or some kind of concept story on you know, meth in the heartland or whatever, but they wouldn't be part of normal coverage. So, so that was one criterion. The other was these were cities that had some problem. They'd had an economic dislocation, they'd had an environmental issue or whatever. And we got, over the next while, we got a thousand essays from people saying, here's why Moline is the representative American city. Here's why Billings is the city you should come to. And and we just had this embarrassment of of riches. With the help of my sister Sue's husband, John Tierney, we we went through uh, many of these nominees through a process of trial and error and experimentation and happenstance. We started going city to city. We were first, uh, the first long visit was to Senator Presser's, Presser's own South Dakota. We were in Sioux Falls for quite a while. We were in Holland, Michigan. We were in the Northeast. And we just started thinking as time went on, there is much more here than we thought. And so over a period of about four years, we traveled about half of the time. We traveled around doing reports for the Atlantic's website. We did some uh, radio reports with Marketplace Radio. We did some films with the Atlantic's film team. And about a year and a half ago, we thought there is ballast here to do a, a book and to try to say there's a story of the other America 
that is different from what we are getting from most of the uh, the mainstream media. And so that's what we were. That's why we started doing this book. And now I give you I, I give you Deb to tell us about schools. So. <laughs> I know I'm not supposed to start a sentence saying so, but it's just kind of a, I'll be honest with you. Um, every town we went to, one of the first things we did after we met the usual suspects, the mayor, school superintendent, the librarians, maybe some founding fathers, who people, chamber of commerce, was to ask, what, who are the interesting people we should meet in this town? What's going on in this town? And tell me about an interesting school in this town. Where should I go visit? Often there was only one school, so there wasn't a choice. In other towns like Greenville, South Carolina, we could have stayed for three weeks and gone to a different school every day. There were so many great schools. What we learned after a while is that is this very interesting thing going on in the country, not only that there are so many diverse, interesting kinds of mostly public schools we went to, public schools and some charter schools, is that they were kind of a metaphor for how important the local, the sense of the local, the sense of the local assets are in towns that we went to. For example, uh, in, in Greenville, South Carolina, which is now very industry heavy with B BMW, Michelin, GE, a very tech-minded town, the tech community has gotten together with the, the public school community and the civic community and said, look, we want to work together. We want to collaborate and help you develop our, our growing workforce. So they have mostly all the, there is a very strong strain of public STEM schools in the town, starting with pre-K through four, the A.J. Wittenberg Elementary School of Engineering. It's a bona fide tech school that volunteers from these tech companies will go to work at and, and help the little bit of kids learn their tech all the way through, you know, through high school. It's kind of grown with the children, so now there are, are middle schools where the, the industry has come to the school system and said, look, you're doing a great job with STEM. Let's insert the arts into this because we want to have kids who are, who know how to talk, who know how to debate, who know how to communicate so they the stem moved to steam inserting the a for arts and it goes all the way through high school another example of leaning on the lo local relevance is winters california a town of about 10,000 people 500 kids in the high school half of them are enrolled in not only their standard liberal arts program but uh, um, an ag program, like they're in, in FFA, Future Farmers of America, but these kids take a, a full-fledged curriculum in agriculture. What's the history and the economics of agriculture in California? Winters is right at the kind of the northern edge of the Central Valley. They learn about farm equipment, how to use it, how to maintain it. They learn about the business of running farms. They have a farm at their school, and they've planted almond trees, which are one of the staples in the mainly nut fruit like apricots and stuff like that and and other kinds of trees there so these kids are growing up with a sense of of how not only how their parents work in in town but how they can be prepared to take over their business and also you know in a very new microbiological best practices way they may not do it but it, this kind of pairing of what's important locally to how the schools work is something that we've seen in a whole bunch of other towns. Another, another really interesting uh, long-time development, actually, are what's called the governor's schools, I, which was new to me. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with the governor's schools. There are about 20 states around the country that have these public boarding schools for juniors and seniors. We went to one in uh, Mississippi, Mississippi School of Mathematics and Science, and one in, in Greenville, South Carolina for Arts and Humanities. So they fan out across the state, pick up kids who are interested in either, of, and have a background in either of those passions, and bring them to the school for two years, teach them everything about, let me give you one example, Donnelly Gunn, a young man from Colum Columbus, Mississippi, who uh, wha went to high school there, was kind of unhappy because he wasn't a football player, and he said, everything in this town's about football. So he ended up going to the, the mathematics and science school there, 
And um, two years later, when we visited, he was a senior. He had built his own 3D printer, which I considered, you know, quite an amazing feat. It looked like it, did, it was not pretty. It looked like a homemade car, but it was functioning. And, and he won a Gates Millennial Scholarship and was on his way to Harvey Mudd with his next step intended to be come back to the Golden Triangle of Mississippi, start some businesses, employ some people, and one by one we got this sense of how these schools are changing not only the kids' lives, but changing potentially the future of those towns. Um, I can stop here and you can go on. Yeah. So my next stint will be telling you things that we discovered that we think you would find surprising, you know, that we didn't know five years ago and that have, uh, that we've uh, mulled over. And so I'll just kind of touch some of these in topic sentence form. And of course, all the ample details are available inside the book. I should say, as a side note, the book is deliberately presented as a narrative rather than an argument. My default mode for writing is strict debate style argument. Here's my point. Here's why you should agree. Here's why you should not disagree. Here's my point. Uh, this is instead story. We went here. We went there. We went there. We learned this. We learned that. But here are the points. You now, here are some of the, the points we learned. Um, one involves what I think of as talent dispersal. As we're, we're all living in D.C., we live the idea that talent is concentrated in the big centers. Finance, New York, politics, D.C., the industry, Los Angeles, tech, San Francisco, et cetera. And those pressures are longstanding. They do go on. But it was amazing how, how vivid was the sense, and now being backed up by actual statistics, of a sort of reverse dispersal of people who think, yes, I could have a job in New York, but the overall life balance is so much better in Columbus, Ohio where my family is, where the real estate cost is one quarter as much, where I can get things done, where I can feel involved. And we saw this place after place after place in, in, in Greenville and in Fresno and even in Susan Mai's hometown of Redlands, California, where, the, where there's a tech company that has transformed this town. Its founder had three choices of where to locate this enormous tech company. Uh, Cambridge, Mass., where he's in graduate school, Palo Alto, where his money came from, or Redlands, California, where he was from. And so we decided to base it there, and it just has, has, has transformed the town. And we saw a lot of that, of people just thinking, yes, New York is there, but for me, in Sioux Falls, I can have a better life, or in Duluth, or in Des Moines, or wherever else. So that, that is, is interesting. A second um, related point is the, pot is the pervasiveness and potential motivating power of being looked down on. Most of the country feels looked down on in one way or another. You know, if you're in greater New York and you're not in Manhattan, you feel looked down on. If you're in West Virginia, you feel looked down on by everybody or in Mississippi. Central Valley, California versus the coast, the middle versus the coast, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was really vivid how often this came up as a factor in local life and how it could be motivating. I'll just give you the example of Fresno. Um, who's been to Fresno here? You know, those of us who are Californians know that Fresno is not the stylish part of California. Coming from the Inland Empire myself, I can say that down in Southern California. But Fresno, its motto right now is unapologetically Fresno. And also Fres, yes. These are its mottos. And we saw signs of that many places of sort of the, and I have a whole story in the book about when Mississippi got a helicopter factory, what it meant for Mississippi to be able to do that. Um, another just a, a very consequential but briefly mentioned factor involves immigration. We know how polarizing immigration is as a national rhetorical issue right now. What was dramatic in places even with recent uh, ethnic changes in Holland, Michigan, a traditionally Dutch city that's now majority Latino, or in Dodge City, Kansas, also majority Latino, or in Sioux Falls, which has a substantial refugee population, or Burlington, the similar thing, how the more immigrants there are, the calmer everybody is about it. You know, the, the hysteria is mainly where there are not immigrants. Uh, Steve King, the most anti-immigrant uh, current congressman, his district is 93% white. And that, that sort of is, is a, a sign that, that through American history, in my view, immigration has never been entirely easy. 
for every wave there's been resistance, but, but it has continued. I think that normal process is going on now. Um, one or two other points that, that are interesting. On the question of sort of economic desperation and misery, certainly we went to a lot of places that have had really hard economic times. San Bernardino, we spent a lot of time in, the, the most troubled city in California and Mississippi and Erie PA and, and other places that have suffered tremendous losses. And an interesting factor to us was, was the contrast between their portrayal and the national media, where these places are mainly the objects of enormous international forces grinding down people, and their self-image as fully three-dimensional people who are doing things themselves and making decisions. And there were, there were problems they had, but but most places felt as if the direction was positive, even if there were a number of, of, of challenges they had, you know, serious challenges, opioids being the, 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 the worst of them. I guess the final point I'll make in the surprises category is how institutionally innovative America seemed at the local level. Uh, government, the term government makes you depressed in general. Uh, education, you know, school system, most people think the public schools elsewhere than where they are are bad. But most people felt as if their own local governments and their own school systems and their own conservation projects and all the rest were being agile and were being experimental or being innovative. And so the contrast between the national level just despair on these issues and the kind of local level vitality was impressive. So those are some of the surprises. And when it comes to institutional renovation, this brings you to you and libraries. It does. And one of the surprising local inst public institutions in towns that we found were the most creative, the most imaginative, the most inventive were the public libraries. You know, as a kid, we remember these as Craig Siebert, Vermilion, Ohio. The Ritter Public Library was a place where you had to be very quiet and kind of tiptoe in and find your way to a corner to read, and that was about it. If you go into a public library today, I guarantee there are three important things happening, one in technology, one in education, and one in civic and social life. In the, in the world of technology, you have kind of high-tech and low-tech going on. In the high-tech department, there are maker spaces. And for those of you who think, as I did at the beginning, what the heck are maker spaces doing in public libraries? When Benjamin Franklin was doing some of his electricity experiments, the first ones he did were conducted in the Philadelphia Library Company. So it, this is kind of coming full circle to where it happened. There are young entrepreneurs and startup people sitting at the, at the main library desks. You can spot them day after day because they may not be able to afford where they're going to have their office, so they go to the public library. I asked a few of the librarians, do you resent this? You know, these kids are kind of kids, are kind of taking over the library with their business. It says, we welcome them. We hope that when they have successful businesses, they'll remember where they started in these public libraries. On the low end, I'll just give you one, one poignant story from Columbus, Ohio, which is, you know, one of the main things that happens in libraries uh, t in technology of learning the computers are job searches. People People are looking for jobs, and they go to the public library, and they ask the librarians to help them. There was a young man in the Columbus Public Library who went in and was working with the librarian. They scoured the you know, digital yellow pages, found something that was a good match, and the librarian said to him, here's the application on the screen. Fill it in. I'll come back in 15 minutes, and we'll check it out and see what you've done, what help you need. That happened. She came back 15 minutes later and found that he had picked up a marking pen and filled in the application on the screen of the, of the, of the computer. So that is, that is low-end technology of what goes on in, in the public libraries. Education is another huge thing. I would say that in about 75% of the libraries that I went into, the first, the first bit of instruction was the li from the librarians was, you got to see the children's section. And that was in Demopolis, Alabama, Winters, California, Eastport, Maine, Duluth. Duluth. Yeah, and name any city. And they were largely the most beautiful, you know, vibrant, active points of the community, of the library. In San Bernardino, California, which, as Jim said, is, is 
we can call it the most troubled town in California. The, the one good part of that library was the children's section. And, and the, the librarian was telling me that's how they pull the families in. They make it great for the kids, and the parents come in, and then they all discover the library. In Witters, California, they have the Friends of the Librarian has a, a single person designated as, as um, the one who goes out to bring in the, the babies. So she goes stroller spotting on the sidewalk and, and scours the hospital records, like who's had a baby. And she'll find these babies with her parents, of course, <laughs> and, and give them packets of a little hat, a hand-knit cap, a library card, books in either Spanish or English, whatever they need, and, and, tell, and use that as a way of drawing people into what's going on in the libraries. Um, it goes through high school. We, we just saw, the, we were in the Brooklyn Public Library last night, and they said, the, the person helping us <laughs> showed us a room where the local community college was having some of its courses. So they've got that. The biggest draw in Redlands, California is the adult literacy program. Scads of adults teaching adults how to read in the library. And finally, you've got my favorite part. Maybe it shouldn't be, but it is. The social and civic aspects of the library. You know that's the place to go for citizenship courses, um, ESL courses, but did you know that it's also the place to go learn the tango? I, a year ago in the spring, I went over to the MLK library at 4 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon, 80 people doing the tango <laughs> to, mu to live music. Um, also, it, at the Brooklyn Library, they were advertising, they have two really curious things, which are not that unusual. A 24-hour marathon, your library is open. It's called the Night of Philosophy. They have, t they, have they have talks from philosophers they bring in from France, believe it or not. And they, they have all kinds of programs. And this weekend, they were having, they were pairing yoga plus poetry. So you go there, do your yoga, and listen to poetry at the same time. It's Brooklyn, right. The Georgetown Public Library here has poetry. Uh, poetry. They probably do. They have yoga every Tuesday morning. I know, because I go. Um, and the, the array of things lent besides books is fascinating. If you're in Burlington in the winter, you can, you can borrow snow shovels. The kids come in and do that for separate jobs. In Duluth, Minnesota, you can borrow seeds if you bring back you know, your seeds from your crop the next year. In Vermilion, Ohio, go to the children's section and borrow a fishing pole and go out to Lake Erie and go fishing. It's, it's phenomenal, the number of things that you can borrow in libraries. So they are this public institution that has grown, evolved, and is filling in so many of the gaps that are appearing. They're filling in the gaps in towns. So this is the last little segment from me, and then we'll have the, the questions and discussions and all that. I'm sure many of you are wondering, can this possibly be true? And if it were true, what would then, uh, then, then what would the consequences be? So every so often we run into some social scientists who said, well, what was your research method? You know, how was your control group? This is not a social science project. This is reporting and going out and seeing what we saw. And we don't pretend this was some kind of pure scientific sample of America. We were looking for cities that had some kind of story. So we had a bias in favor of those that had coped with the challenges that had come to them. But we went to a lot of places that had really hard times. You know, if you've been to San Bernardino, you know that is a place that has had troubles. And Erie, Pennsylvania, too, and Charleston, West Virginia. And so we felt as if, over time, we didn't have a control group experiment, but we saw a range of situations of communities doing better and worse. And also, I then have the follow-up point. If you think we are crazy and that nothing like can, this can be the case and that our basic proposition is untrue, our basic proposition being that if you didn't know about national politics, you would think it was a good time in the country. You would think that communities were basically finding their way forward. If you think that's not true, here is my control group experiment for you, which is over the next year, go to half a dozen places you haven't been before. And when you get there, don't ask people about Trump or Hillary Clinton or Mueller or the Russians but ask them about their town and say, is it better here than it was? What's getting better? What's getting worse? And that was the process that led us to this 
uh, this this conclusion. So th that that is my my response to the skeptical. But what if you actually agreed with what we're saying that there is this kind of local level momentum, which is at such stark odds with the national level bitterness and paralysis and anything else that you want to say about about our current life. Um, we have thought about this a lot, and we have a historical analysis and a prospective sort of to-do list. Um, the historical analysis is that in a lot of ways, the, the agonies the U.S. is going through now are not directly like those 125 years ago at the turn of the 20th century in the original Gilded Age, but there are a lot of similarities. There's the disruption of rapid immigration. There's the disruption of very sudden technological job loss. There's political corruption. There's lack of faith in political institutions. There's so many things in parallel from 1880s through, you know, even FDR and, and right now, which makes me look with great interest at the countervailing forces in those days. And when, when you look back on them, you realize that Louis Brandeis, in talking about the laboratories of, that states being laboratories of democracy, that actually was, was imprecise. There were all these dispersed local level, sort of citizen level movements taking place, the labor movement, the <clears throat> the original uh, African-American rights movement, the women's movement, the environmental movement, all of which were in dispersed ways gathering momentum and trying out different approaches to the, the country's problems so that when there was a different political climate, initially with Teddy Roosevelt and then in different ways with Woodrow Wilson and FDR, there were ideas on hand that could be applied. <clears throat> and I think the positive, if that's the historical analysis, the positive application for to do right now is that we are all in the process of running those experiments uh, across the country of seeing what approaches to civic engagement and changing education and preserving the environment and and uh, buffering the effects of economic inequality and dealing with uh, opioids and other other issues the experiments are being run in real time all across the country and i think deb and i feel a a mission to try to connect these people and to recognize that what is happening in Fresno is very similar to what's happening in Greenville, South Carolina, and that what's happening in Burlington, Vermont, is a lot like what's happening in Bend, Oregon. And there is there is an unaware there's an unaware network that needs to be sort of made more aware of itself, and to have the momentum and the confidence that can come of feeling that feeling as if you're part of something larger and part of on the winning side. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not on the losing side of a cold, but uh, there's a, the winning side of a lot. Deb, would you like to take over this point? Would you? <laughs> so essentially, uh, what we feel we want to do for the foreseeable future is both to continue to learn about these stories, but also to continue to tell them and connect people who are in the maker movement in Louisville with their counterparts in San Bernardino and people who are doing environmental conservation in South Georgia with their counterparts in Washington State and in Montana, where there's a huge effort. So I think there is, there is this sense of the destiny of this period being within our collective hands uh, if we sort of get engaged and deal with it. Deb, I turn into <laughs> and, and I, that I feel is like all. Camille, <laughs> yes. I, yeah. And we will be happy to take questions. <laughs> OK, okay. Yeah. If, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand, and I'll give you the, uh, the mic. But let me just hang on to the mic for one. Second, uh, because one of the more intriguing um, indicators of local vitality that you <coughs> seem to have found uh, has to do with craft beer. Uh, talk about that for a minute. I can start reporting on that, but I know Jim's going to want to play. So we, I have this classmate from college named Jim Cook, who is the founder of Sam Adams. And we, uh, Jim is a, a great craft beer aficionado. So every time we landed in a, in a town, the first thing we did when we were hot, tired, dirty was find the local brew pub. And there always was one. <laughs> it, it became a sign, an important indicator to us that if a city was showing signs of success that it would make it, they had a local brew pub. Numbers of them claimed that at least part of the reason was that they had the best water in the company in the country. Greenville says that, Duluth says that, New York says that. Redland says that. Redland, sa Redland says that. So that's at least four and counting. Um, 
So here is a question of his, uh, whether we can change minds in real time. The question is going to be about Jimmy Carter, a former president. I'm going to have sort of show of hands. How many people think Jimmy Carter was really a successful president? Okay, now I'm going to give you a, a fact and see if the vote changes. Jimmy Carter was the man who made the craft brew revolution possible. How many people think Jimmy <laughs> Carter was a successful president? <laughs> so the, the way he did that is he deregulated home brewing. So in the mid-1800s, there were every town in America had a brewery because there was no refrigeration. Beer had to be local. After Prohibition, it, there was the era of concentration. There were only about 80 breweries in the entire country by the 1970s when Carter, hero of America, deregulated craft brewing. And now they're like five or 6,000. You know, every town has a, has a little craft brewery. And it's a, it's a proxy in itself for a certain entrepreneurial class, a certain customer class. And it's a real sort of vector for developing tattered uh, parts of, of town because breweries go where the land is cheap. People come to where the breweries are. And you have a sort of a, a domino effect. And it's related to local food movements, local production movements of all kinds. And this sounds... Oh, so cute and she she, but it's a real thing. There are hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people in the craft brew industry now, which is classified as manufacturing. Don't that's you know just how it is, and uh, there there are, are other kind of uh, local uh, local movements of that sort. So craft brewing is real. It's here, and thank you, Jimmy Carter. And it's changing towns. Yes, it's yeah. changing towns. Okay, I'm gonna start on this side first, and and uh, and then go to that side. Uh, so who, who's got a question? Hello. Um, you might guess from my accent that I'm from Australia. And one of the things that's happened in Australia, and I'm interested to know if it happens here as well, is that towns that have um, used to be on the highway, for example, and then got bypassed because bigger roads and wider roads were built somewhere. One of the things that started to happen is that um, with tree change kind of movement, people have moved to country towns and foodies have started up a little bit like the craft brewery. And so what's happening now is that there are um, routes, if you like, or routes where um, people go from one town to the next for the best baked pro products, for the best whatever. And I'm wondering if, if you're seeing similar things here in regions, if towns are coming together in that way. What, what were you talking yes. about? Which one? One's in upstate New York, in Michigan, uh, in, up in Northern California. Yeah, we've, we've actually heard about uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, which is, is struggling hard and well, and I think will succeed to come out of, of the closure, uh, largely in part closure of, uh, mostly closure of the General Electric plant, is becoming uh, a real, a place that the young people who grow up there want to go back to. Um, and they're starting to do it with, with some small manufacturing and a lot of refugee input who are coming, you know, uh, happy to be there from places like Syria. Now, 10% of the population in Erie, Pennsylvania is refugees, and they are becoming a strong economic base. But Erie is still small, and they are looking to the, to regionally to try to kind of pair up with towns near them to become, to become stronger towns. As far as routes like hop from yeah, A to B? We, we saw those. There, were, there was the upstate beer route in New York and one in, in uh, something similar in Michigan. So and, and I guess biking routes across the great northern plains, but yeah. Jim, you talked about wanting to connect people in these different places. This is sort of a follow-on to the first question. And uh, you know, one way would, of course, be if they all, all would read your book and they would get some uh, uh, ideas from that. But how would you sort of take that uh, to scale? Well, this is a question on our mind for which I don't have an actual answer at this moment. But it's something that, that I, I'm, I'm there are we're impressed by how many extant networks there are that don't connect with each other. The, for example, the maker movement I used to laugh at. I now think it's a real thing. Um, I have a whole chapter in there about Louisville, Kentucky, and the way the tools of the maker movement have shifted things that I had seen 10 years earlier in China back to Louisville because they could be made very quickly. And, and so the maker movement has a network. The libraries... Even the libraries is a, yeah. is a curious place. You'd think that they would all know about each other, uh, but not only do they say we're the best kept secret in town, 
which is not something that they want to be. But I get emails from librarians across the country who maybe have read a post or something saying, how can I find other libraries that are doing things so I can find out ideas and best practices from them? Just giving voice to some of this. I so, so the point is, there's a lots of these networks. So there's a library network, the downtown network. There's the there's the local food network. So there's all these different networks that that don't have a connection point now. And so, and and even the ones that should have a connection yeah. point, just talking about it, I think, is a start. Yes, and, and and so so I think stage one of what we have in mind is that simply shedding light on the potential of these positive developments. That, that, that is stage one. Stage two is thinking about ways you could have, whether electronically or through organizations or through meetings or whatever, just ways to, to give momentum. And so again, we study what happened in the late 1800s and early 1900s, where you had nationwide movements of, from free silver to women's suffrage, whatever, just the, the way that those spread. So. Your question is a good one. My answer is not as good as your question, but it's one we'll be thinking about. Anybody else over here? Yes, hi, Jim, and hi. thank you so much for your book. I have a question based on my book that you endorsed, Mental Health Incorporated, which showed so many uh, communities not doing things that work in the area of mental health, addiction, and, 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 and opioids, even though there's bodies of evidence, and I'm mystified about how the good people in those communities that are doing such great and important innovations in these areas that are like literally killing people, like the Wellbeing Trust has a study out that if nothing changed the way we handle addiction and mental health issues, in the next decade, 1.6 million people will die from suicide, uh, addiction, and, and alcoholism. And so my question is, how come they do such good work that on these really key issues and things that are affecting them right next door where people are overdosing like crazy they're not I know Charleston is trying to do it why the disconnect between doing things that are proven to work that they don't do in this field but they do in your local thing so this is our friend Art Levine author of many influential mental health and other other books so this is another good question for which I have another not very good answer um, and, and the preface to my answer would be the two sort of worst things we saw going on were opioids in general, which is just a nationwide catastrophe that, that most places feel overwhelmed by, and not simply the conventional diagnosis, oh, industrial despair, but just you know, much broader than that. And the other is, of course, gun violence. You know, those are two things where just it's really hard to see an immediate path forward. The question of why people can be partially well-meaning, partially altruistic, partly community-minded, but not in all ways is a disturbing one. And the disconnect between how people think about national politics and effects out there versus their own community is also something that we don't have an answer to, but we're just trying to, to highlight the contrast. So I, I don't know. I, I think that, that in, you know a lot more about opioids, the problem than I do, my impression is there has not been an available, you know, good answer in, in, in the short run to it. So, again, I observe this as a real problem for which I don't have a, a clear answer. Do you have a clear answer, Deb? Of course not. I mean, if I did, I'd be running some department or something, probably. But uh, what we have seen what, in some small towns where maybe it's easier to manage our collaborative efforts, say, among the police department, the social services organizations, and the school systems who are talking to each other to, because they know their small town and they know where the problems are. They even know who the people are, and we even know who the people are from some of the towns where we visited. And, and they're tiny inroads, but it, in a way, it's, it's it's like some of these other problems where it it works it can work out better in small towns because people know who to call when there's a problem. Um, so it's you know maybe that's another effort way that it, things start to bubble up. Let's go to the other side of the room. Hi, um, back when I was in college, I industries were closing down all over the place. 
has there been much in the way of retooling like you described in Louisville? Let me give you two, at least I have an answer to this one. Uh, unlike the, the previous, there may not be exactly the answers you're looking for, but they're, they're the ones I have. Uh, one is, I am impressed both from the large scale of American history I've lived through myself, and from reading about the rest of it, how, how much the story of American social history is continued, continual dislocation. I bet everybody in this room has a story of a parent or grandparent who was forced out of one region or one, one line of work by industrial change. I certainly do. I know Deb does, of, of you know, our, our uh, forebears who had to change what they were doing. An incredible but actually true fact is that as late as about 1890, most Americans were farmers. So, you know, that time still, mo you know, and it's now like 2% of the population. So there's been that, that complete upheaval in people's um, lines of work. So there has, point one, as a bedrock point, this has been a continual process. And the opportunity of, and, and justice of any stage of our history depends on how the U.S. sort of creates new opportunities for the young people and buffers the older people who don't usually recover. If they, if they lose a job in middle age, and that just is how it's been from the 1700s onward. So one is, is the sort of continuation of this. The other is on manufacturing itself, what we saw as sort of the next job source is, is not just the small manufacturers that we saw in Louisville and also San Bernardino and also Sioux Falls of these small high-tech manufacturers in aerospace or GPS-guided agriculture. Uh, early on, we had a picture on our site of Deb next to this tractor that would have practically would have barely fit into this room in Sioux Falls. It was GPS guided so that it could put a seed one place and a drop of fertilizer on exactly that place and a little drop of water on exactly that place and not disturb any of the soil around that. And so that that's a, a manufacturing industry there. So there are these manufacturing opportunities, but even more, there's this category of skilled technical jobs welders every place we went there were vacancies for welders at you know at, at jobs comparable to sort of old factory wages and robotics repairmen and repair people and all that's uh, wind turbine installers is a huge um, growth industry so i think the the people whose whose parents used to work on a factory and got laid off the opportunity for them is essentially these skilled trade jobs which is why we came to think that community colleges were the most important part of the educational system at the moment. And uh, interesting signs, uh, say from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or uh, Holland, Michigan, people will say, we've always been a town that makes things. We've always been a town that builds. And they, they are very nimble in not building or making what they used to build, but are starting to build other things. And poignant stories from, from young people in Duluth, Minnesota, who said, you know, we'd really like to come back to Duluth. There's not going to be an industry or a job from there, so I guess I'll have to make up something myself. And these young guys from, for the, from, from the cities, from the cities, who went to school at UMD, University of Minnesota Duluth, um, were manufact they look like California hippies, but in fact they were making um, skateboard ramps, which became a quite successful industry and with then they thought we're wasting a lot of our product so with the, these the leftovers they started making what has become lol furniture it's kind of outdoor outdoor looks like old south carolina rocking chairs but made out of a composite and then there was still stuff left over from that so they thought okay we'll make kitchen utensils out of the leftovers and that has become a very successful epicurean i bet a bunch of people here have those utensils Whatever is left may be fancy toothpicks next. I don't know, but those kids who started out in a in a um, burial vault factory, factory <laughs> that was a brownfield have now spread out all over town and probably have 80 people and are shipping all over the world. Example after example of that, I mean, that's a great example, but there are many ones where they're creating new, very small industries that are, you know, by the dozens employing new people with new ideas. Anyone else? It's more of a social question, but how did you find race relations? And um, 
are your findings differentiated by region? We went to every corner of the country, you know, again, not systematically, but we were in Eastport, Maine, very, very far northeast Maine. We were in Ajo, Arizona, down on, on near the Mexican border and up in, in Washington State. So we were all, all over the place in Mississippi and Georgia and South Carolina. And there were every place was its own place. So there were regional differences that way, but it was more sort of local personality than it was, oh, the Northeast is that way and the South is that way, although the South is its own particular way. I think there were, on the race relations front, there's nothing we found that would be a revolutionary surprise to anybody who has lived in America. You know, that, that America's fundamental problem is the legacy of, of, of slavery, and that remains the case. But that's why it was the more why we were so taken by northern Mississippi, where we spent so much time, the way the Mississippi School of Math and Science in particular has made wrestling with racial, the racial heritage part of its mission. And it's mixed, uh, its student body, which is of you know racially diverse from all over the state, they do these reenactments of what their city was like during Reconstruction. And they have an old cemetery there in Columbus, which was a wartime cemetery for the Battle of Shiloh. And they have people there playing the roles of soldiers from both sides, and and I mean it, it's it's very dramatic. And May eighth, yesterday was uh, is Emancipation Day in Mississippi when the Union troops came through Alabama, and that is the day that they count as for, as freeing the slaves. So we happened to be there on May eighth a couple of years ago to see this reenactment in the cemetery by the kids. The first year there were they invite the town to experience this with them and just. They write their stories, they sing their music, and everybody is amazed, and they all start talking about it. Black people, white people, every kind of people in Columbus, Mississippi. Um, two years ago, when we were there, they had about, I don't know, 80 people, and the next year they had 200 people. This year I haven't gotten the road report yet because it was only yesterday, but I, I'm sure it's even more. A and one more thing. Duluth, Minnesota, where you'd oh. kind of least expect it, there was a famous lynching that happened in about 1920. A circus came through town. There were African American workers at that circus. There was an alleged, later proven, you know, total fabrication and rumor, uh, advances toward a white woman in the town. And three of the black men were rounded up and lynched on the spot in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, about 10 years ago, um, or 20 years ago as a, as a kind of, when people started writing about this and talking about this, they said out loud, this is the worst thing that's ever happened in this town and we have to come to terms with it. So the artistic community and the literary community and, and the civic community got together and they made this most beautiful memorial in a corner of the town where people now, it, you know, there aren't a whole lot of black people in Duluth, Minnesota, but it was a very important part of their history that they had to address first on and did it through face on and did it through this, this artistic expression. It was the first lynching m memorial in the United States, I believe, in, in Duluth. You know, the new one in Montgomery. That's true. Yeah, it probably was. Um, it sounds like one way of characterizing your work is as an examination of our national identity. You're, you're going out to try to find out who, who America really is. And um, it's, it, we all see a lot of uh, uh, pressures in different directions, some uh, centrifugal uh, and, and other centripetal. But um, uh, after the Second World War, the Second World War was sort of a great unifying event. And, and uh, if you watch the movie, uh, best years of our lives, you see it uh, uh, right there in the small town and the, the way people are pulled together. I, I'm wondering, do you have conclusions about whether our, uh, we're, we're uh, headed toward greater national unity or greater national disunity? You mentioned the importance of networks. I'd be interested in your insights. I'm a great believer in the provisionality of life, you know, nothing is fated. Um, there are two enormously consequential presidential elections in our history, 2000 and 2016, that could, in each case, a thousand factors had to break in a certain way to have the result that it happened. I mean, a, a life is 
there's nothing inevitable in, in our, our national life. The Civil War was a close run thing, at least early on. And, and so, so I don't have any idea what will happen in the United States. I think that after we lived in China for a long time, I became sort of a fundamental bull on the United States relative to China because I think we have so many fundamental advantages. But there are lots of national level structural problems now. I think our argument is the potential is there for another sort of renewal, renaissance, uh, solving the problem of having these huge American potential resources so ill-matched to our national challenges, so closing that gap. So I think our message is the potential is to pull together again and recognize, um, recognize the possibility for solutions if the spirit we've seen city by city could somehow percolate upwards towards the... Uh, the higher national level, I don't know whether that will happen. Um, so related to that, you, you sort of half answered the question. I was just thinking people are complex when you said how can they be partially altruistic and how can they, you know, they, they ignore some things and they work on others. And communities are complex, right? So the people that you talk to um, who were doing innovative things, positive things, trying to make a difference in their community, pulling it, you know, forward, are they the same people that you see on the news screaming these ugly, angry, you know, epithets at people? Or do you think the people, that they're not the same people, or are they that divided within individuals? Or do you not have it? I, I will tell you my, my theory on that, and Deb can see if she agrees or disagrees. I, I, I think that, you know, there always has been, just as I was saying, there's always been dislocation in industrial life. There's always been a bitter fringe in any modern society. There's always been something you could think of as the base. A surprising statistic is when Herbert Hoover, when Herbert Hoover ran for re-election in 1932, during the depths of the Depression, how much the vote did he get? He got 40% of the vote against FDR. You know, there is a base there. And, and so I think that the people in the news, they're ones who have felt empowered and unleashed and unembarrassed by, by the reason, as opposed to being um, I think they've always been there, but they're now sort of more empowered to, to, to speak out. I think that the, the contradiction we saw was people who, in Dodge City, Kansas, the mainly white um, electorate there has a Latino city manager who they love, but he's here on a DACA waiver, and they voted for a president who's going to kick him out. So that, that contradiction, I think it's because in their own city, they recognize the sort of the humanity of this guy, but national politics is this abstraction. It's sort of like some religious thing. Well, we know we hate Hillary Clinton, so that's how we're going to vote, but that's not related to our, our local circumstances. So I, I think it's, I think these are different people, the ones who are doing the Klan rallies. They've been there all along, and they're just, they're allowed to come out of the, the closet now. So, so there's time for two more questions. We'll take one from this side and one from that side. I think this is related, and that is for the people who are doing the creative work in the communities where you've been, um, are there any any insights you've had as to how they what role they might see for the federal government, or do they see it as all local? Again, is there some kind of a role that begins to emerge for the federal government? You know, we... We went to ask people about their towns, and it was surprising to us how little the national conversation or comments about the national conversation came up. I think people were generally not waiting for something to happen from the top down, but were rather creating that them, it themselves. They, if there were cuts coming from at a federal level, they were figuring out ways to make up for it at the local level, and it. It wasn't the answers maybe out of frustration, out of just giving up, out of, out of whatever, or figuring out it would work a whole lot faster if they did it themselves. Um, only in one town in Ajo, Arizona, was there, there was a, a woman who, who had worked in DC who knew everything about how to get federal funding for this, that, or the other thing, and worked that system so well that she was really helping turn the town around. But most people can't do that. It's just too hard, and it's just too complicated. And we saw many more efforts of giving day in, in Bend, Oregon, or Winters, California, or Ajo, Arizona, no matter where it was, that, that people would look to themselves and reach into their own pocketbooks to do things, whether it was 
a levy for the library, a new school, a recreation center, or a craft center. It just, that's where, that's, that's where you knew you could have an effect. But, but simultaneously, the NEA and the NEH and things like that matter to people. So, so if they keep going down the long run, that will have an impact. Uh, thank you both. Just a wonderful presentation. I just have a quick question for both of you. First, Deb, uh, it would be, um, you mentioned, Deb and, and Jim, that there are certain groups or certain types of places you went to, libraries and, uh, and also schools. You mentioned just now a carnival or some special uh, event. Did you ever just roam? You know, did you ever just roam through a city and bump into somebody you hadn't expected? So oh, yeah. Okay, I got the answer for that one. Okay. Every town we went to, I went to the YMCA's. And if you want to just roam, you go into YMCA. It's, I, I went to swim. I, one of my swimming buddies is here. The public pools are, are the place to go and the place to be when you want to find new friends, Didi, or else run into people you would otherwise never run into. And I, and I found... And so, yes, we, we were always out. We went to the ba local baseball games. You know, we went walking on the river walks. We went to the brew pubs. We went to the parks. We, hung, we actually hung out a lot in places and met people where we were least expecting. But I, I will put in a plug for the YMCAs because not only do you run into people, but, you know, you swim next to them. You're in a naked locker room <laughs> next to them. And, and um, you see how that community is mixing and mingling where they don't don't if they walk outside the Y. Great. And for Jim, my fellow Californian, um, you know, I'm curious. Uh, when you, you went to Redlands, you went to San Bruno, you grew up in California as I did. When I was young in LA, I would spread a map out and, and look at these little towns, Needles and Blythe, and you know, here you found winners, I guess. I didn't even know it was there. And I'd write the Chamber of Commerce, and I couldn't wait to get the package back. You know? So I'm, my question is, when you were young, growing up, did anything occur in those years that might, have set, that might have linked you to this project? Interesting. I have not thought of that, but um, you know, I always the reason I have loved spending all of my working life as a reporter and writer is that the two, it, it involves two basic functions. Finding out about things and telling people about them. And those are the two things I've always liked doing. So I have a structural reason to go learn about new things and say, well, this will be surprising each day and then, 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 then tell people about it. And I think that that's something we enjoyed both when we were in China, our normal dinner table conversation was, you won't believe what horrible but interesting thing just happened today <laughs> and on the road it was always you won't believe what we learned today so the fact we were just learning things every single day was was the joy of it and that's something i've always enjoyed doing so and i and i hope you both visited independent bookstores everywhere you are oh yes yes yeah yeah we did yes yeah. okay thank you very much